official talk on uh, on Thursday, which uh, we call defining a roadmap. And during that, it would be really cool if we could find out where we are going to go. But I think before we can find out where we are going to go, I think it's important to establish where we are right now. So let me start this off and, and say that um, VCS PKG was founded because people like Manoj um, used very complex setups, um, version control setups, and distributed version control setups to manage their packages um, to the point where it was absolutely unusable. In 2006, I think, at some point in time, I decided that um, this Arch stuff is... Uh, <laughs> that was food. That was not anything to do with Arch. <laughs> well, no, I, I really appreciated what Manash was doing, and I thought it was great, because in the end, um, it was total overkill, but um, I don't want to discredit Manash's work on this. Um, it was something that was scalable to every single package size. You would maintain changes in branches, and you would use a version control system to do what many of us have been doing in files, and using the Debian archive as a version control system, because it, as a matter of fact it is, but we just keep the last four revisions, or last three revisions. At it's a very bad version control system, I'm very sorry. Yeah, it doesn't have, <laughs> it doesn't have Deb archive diff implemented, for instance. Um, so, I thought, I thought he had a, a great idea, and um, I wanted to spread that idea. I wanted to say, look, people, like, why don't you just all do it like this? And so I looked at this arch thing, and I was like, ah, it's not that complicated. You just have to kind of like understand the big process and do it. And I did an IRC session at one point in time in 2006, where my goal was to explain how you would do a package upgrade, a new version release, with arch with two feature branches, and um, to then to push it to the archive. Is there anyone here who has participated in that discussion on IRC? All right, well, I'm, I'm really glad that my fingers are actually still there, because that discussion took three and a half hours. <laughs> it, was, it was completely mad, and that was partly because of art, but also partly because um, the complexity of the entire process, of using feature branches, of using version control system beyond what CVS and SVN gave you at this point in time, um, just hadn't trickled through. People have not really thought about it, and I can't blame them because you have to be masochistic if you want to look at art. Nowadays, we have a lot of different contenders that are doing the same principles a lot better. There's BZR, there's Git, there's Darks, there's you name it. Um, and my, my thought was, look, we can, we can do exactly what we were trying to do. Version control used for Debian packaging, and not just to actually create a package, but to maintain the package in a scalable way. But when I looked around, and there were a lot of people that were using it. There was Manoj, there was Guido, for instance, who is the maintainer and, and author of a Git build package, who was doing very funky stuff that I've and doing a great job at hmm? Git and doing a great job and I looked at his work and I looked at some other people who were doing the same stuff and I was like okay this is this is really cool because we're all doing the right thing but then I was like if we're really starting to do it right now then maybe we could find one way in which we can unify it, find one workflow that fits everyone, so that we can actually harvest the fruits of this more complex approach and make use of it. And around that time, I also talked to people in Fedora and people in Gen2, and I figured out, for instance, Fedora was doing pretty much exactly the same stuff. They were, at that point in time, trying to use SVN and kind of like um, make it, they didn't really look at Arch, they were trying to use SVN, but then they, they switched to Mercurial, I think, and Ubuntu came and had this idea about sourceless uploads, and the um, Supermirror and BZR, and they had pretty much the same ideas with BZR Loom. And I figured, look, they're, 
a number of different version control systems, and there are a number of different distributions. And as a matter of fact, I think someone, Sledge said it in his uh, talk, we're all doing the same thing, right? We're all taking upstream software and we're modifying it, and then we're presenting it to our users. And the modification part is slightly different, but not very different between the distributions. Everyone has to do some sort of Linux-specific changes. Fedora and Debian could cooperate on those. And Ubuntu and Debian, I mean, the changes that we make that are specific to the Debian style or Deb packages, we could really just profit from each other. And in order to be able to do that, in a way that would make it conducive to everyone, we would need one approach that made it possible using distributed version control systems. And maybe let me jump to the end, and I don't want to talk a lot longer, but I really want to hear from you guys what we're doing. Maybe at the end, the, the sort of thing that I envision is that it'll be so easy to say, look, this problem that we're having right here, or this feature, that's not, that's not thing pessimistically, that's thing optimistically, this feature that Fedora has implemented is something really cool. For instance, uh, with MDADM, the rate maintainer, I mean, they do properly event-driven assembly, which my package doesn't do yet. And I look at that, and I'm just like, I really, really, really want to use that, but I can't because it's so complicated, and they're <laughs> using a completely different version control system. If, in an ideal world, they were using something that was compatible with my workflow, then I could really just say, I'd love to implement this myself, because I'm a hacker, but I don't have any time, so just click here, and there comes the patch, and it's integrated and tracked. It's not just a patch that I ask the Fedora person to give me, but it's a patch that five years from now will still be the same patch, and if they made changes, and if I made changes, and if Susan made changes, we can all profit from that. So that's sort of the vision that I have, and I, from, Starting from Debian, um, I think we're in the position to go that road. I have heard people in Debian say, why would we ever want to do that? Because those are the other distributions, and we are Debian, we don't need to do that. And it's like, you know, like, <laughs> slightly correct and slightly not correct and, and everything. It, it, it's a time saver in the end. So I think it's a, it's, we are in a position where Debian being a conservative distri distribution that prefers to take six years, I think that's sort of the average time span of this debt fund that I used it in this talk, six years is our um, average dis development time for a feature. Um, we take our time, but then we do it right. And so this is the effort that I would like to start. I would like to figure out what it is that we need to do with version control systems in order to maintain maintain packages, and how can we get there, and how can we make it such that other distributions are actually interested and join us in this approach. And one of the reasons that um, I'm happy that there are very many different people around, for instance, Git build package Guido, and <coughs> Manoj unfortunately isn't here, but I pretty much have his approach, but there are other people, um, Stefan, is, are you here? Stefan Glondu? There you go. I'm sorry. <laughs> so many people. Um, you, you previously told me um, about an approach that, that used Quilt and a really, or, or somebody told me an approach that used Quilt and then fit it back into the version control system. And at first glance, I would looked at it and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> like why would you do that? But in the end, you look at it and you're just like, that's really cool. And right now, I'm, I'm not in the position to say this is the right way to do it. And I don't think we will really ever be able to do that. After all, we're Debian, we're all about choice. But there are so many different ideas, and I'd like to make those ideas come together. So before we can define a roadmap on Thursday on what it is that we should actually be doing at some point in time so that we can produce some output, so that we can actually take a step forward, I'd like to figure out what people are doing and, and where you think the challenges are. So maybe one of you has any input or any questions on, or, or would like to voice <laughs> a concern or 
I have the regular concern with importing upstream sources into our repositories because it didn't happen just once that upstream fucked up with some license stuff and took a picture from some site or audio file which they don't have the license for and when you put it in you have to rewrite history and which as everyone knows is a pain. Um, that's why I personally don't feel too good if the workflow that you want to push or the workflow that we all agree upon would mean that we have upstream source directly in <coughs> our repositories. I think you're overestimating the problem. I don't think so. so it happens often all, enough. First of all, the only problem you, the real problem you need to write research for is something you cannot distribute at all. So if it's something which is not the EFS G3, it's fine to have it the history because okay, it's not the EFS G3, but it's not in the archive either. So that's a part of conservation. Well, the second. No, you are still distributing it if you put it into your VCS. Yeah, and but put it's it fine as long as it's not illegal to distribute it. And the second point, we are going to have snapshot again, which is going to have the very same problem. Is, it, is there any cases well, where yeah. anybody who's yeah. been <coughs> sent lawyer letters over random things that were in the VCS history but have since been deleted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm confident enough to say no. Even if right, I, I, don't heard, I think if this is, you know, this is a fact about most of the distributed version control systems, all of them have this same property, that it's really hard to delete things in the prehistory like that. And I think for that reason, you probably know about it. If there were people going around saying, you have to delete this file from your history because it's copyright. We would have heard about that. I don't think this happened. So, so someone figures out the loophole at the start. It happens. <laughs> it, it did happen to one of the upstreams in package games, and it's not just this one. Uh, no, 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 right. So they, they, they put it exactly, especially in this area where where you are looking for special artwork or audio files and stuff. You very often stumble into such problems. I'm distinguishing two, two situations. The first situation is that upstream or somebody commits a revision that contains some undistributable thing. Right? And that, I agree, happens all the time. But normally what happens next is that somebody notices and you say VCS RM, VCS commit, and then as far as you're concerned, you've made the problem go away. And the question I want to ask, and I think the answer is no, is after you've done that and you push the revision, there are no branch heads on your site anymore that point to, the that point to this file. And the only way to find the file is to say, you know, get log, find the thing, yada, yada, yada. Has anybody actually sent any lawyer letter saying, you have to remove this from your history? And I don't think anybody has. Probably not, but I don't want to have this time bomb sitting in my VCS repository. Well, I think this is it's not a time bomb. problem. When they get the lawyer letter, the first thing you have to do is removing it. Well, but you could still extract. I think that's what he means, is that you could still extract it. And I'm sure that there could be lawyers that are right. not going to be happy with The first it. time this happens, we will rewrite the history of that repository. Um, I don't want to name a special <laughs> German <laughs> lawyer that is very well known for doing exactly that things. Well, okay, but as, as Ian said, um, we can, at least in, in with distributed version control nowadays, it's possible to say we will actually rewrite the history and remove all traces of that file. Don't it is possible. It's an issue. Hmm? I don't know who David Greaves is, but he's on IRC and mm -hmm. he wants to say it's an issue. Okay. <laughs> there are people Greaves. on IRC listening. Right, well, it's all very well to say it's an issue, but you know, can we then, you know, if they're on IRC, they've got an internet connection, they should be able to Google up the case where it's actually happened. <laughs> because I don't think it has happened. I don't think anybody has ever threatened, you know, nobody has been made to rewrite their history by a lawyer. 
yet. And well, it's possible that it might happen in a very small number of cases, but I don't think that this is a problem that we need to address. We can cross that bridge when we come to it. Well, well then, go on. We, we had in the, in the history um, cases where upstream was asked to rename its uh, packages because of, um, of uh, because of big companies uh, in, insisting on their names for, uh, for, for products which sounded very similar to, to products. Uh, Still, they didn't ask to rename the packaging fast releases. That's correct. And, but that's, that's one of the things. I mean, right now we have Debbie and Lenny out, and if we happen to find out that there is a, a, a package in there that has an image which is copyrighted, what are we actually going to do? I mean, aren't you stable release yeah. manager? <laughs> well, yeah, you need to rename like, can we actually? Can well, we actually, the only thing we can do as stable release manager is saying, okay, we are either going to remove that package, or we are going to have the package replaced by something uh, else. It's, 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 the the, 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 the name is a different issue because it disappears from current usage relatively quickly, and that's what they're after, right? In the, mm -hmm. in the event of a name, copyright content in a source code repository does not disappear. It is permanently there. Yes. And the once there. it's there, if unless you delete it from the source code repository, it's still accessible to anybody. And their point in asking you to remove it is to make it inaccessible. So yeah, I I believe that it is a much bigger issue than the than the issue of name or too much of a legal discussion, I mean, that, 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 there are other forums for that. Um, <laughs> it is a valid point, and, and I think it's, we've already seen that there are a lot of different uh, positions on it, but None in the end... Legal, uh, hmm? None of us is a lawyer. Probably. Maybe none of us is a lawyer. I, I think that the, the, the problem is that we don't need to ask, the point is we don't need to answer this question yes. by arguing about what some court would think the law would be if some case came up, right? No. This, has been, this situation has been like this, and the, the distributed version control systems have been around for some years now, and we should be able to just look and see whether, in practice, other people have had this problem. And, and if other and people if have not had this problem, then we can carry on, and if they have had this problem, then we need to think hard. And after all, I mean, this is a point that you, Ian, earlier on said, after all, if we actually get to the point where there is a lawyer's letter, at uh, Steve's mailbox and says, look, uh, DPL, you have to like, do something about that, and we remove it, and they are not happy with that. That's still not a point where they can sue. This is my understanding of the law. Um, if you are actually trying to do it, but you, haven't, like, you don't have any malicious intent, that's not necessarily something that's going to get you in front of court again. If there is still a problem with somebody who is savvy enough to operate the version control system, able to extract that copyrighted information, then we will just have to rewrite the history. And, but I think we should worry about that at that point in time when it comes. Um, is this an acceptable way forward? I mean, does it not? Does it does it give you a perspective such that we don't have to stop cold at, before even even thinking about it? Because on the other hand, um, you can always say that. Uh, I mean, package games, for instance, I think is an interesting sub project because you do have artwork, a lot of it, and there is probably a lot more hidden copyright issues than than with code, 
because also the authors aren't necessarily aware of copyright for artwork um, as much as the, the coders may be. Sure, but we're not we're not going to be able to educate everyone. Um, but it, it's something that if you're working for packaged games, you may just have to be extra careful. But the technical solution that we can argue about as a, from a version control perspective is not necessarily something that is that. that the problem is not inherent in the version control um, approach. I think the problem is inherent in the fact that there is a, there is sort of like permanent storage. Like once you've done something, um, it's really hard to get rid of that. I mean, look at Google, look at uh, Web Archive, look at everything. That problem is always going to be there, and we're just going to have to deal with it. So, if, if that's okay, then uh, I, I'd say let's move away from the legal issues and uh, let's let's have a look at what we're doing at this point in time and uh, um, where we would like to go. Is are there people who? Uh, do you so want to say? What, I'm wondering if, whether the goal of finding common workflow is a, the proper goal. What I mean is that. Maybe it's kind of peculiar in the even in the distribution market because we are a lot about diversity. So while Rufus Bizarre, while Fedoras, whatever, while not distribution and whatever else, we have six or seven different BCS, which are all quite popular. I mean even at the most player we have a lot of them. And you know, we, we care about leaving the possibility of having a bit different BCS. Similarly, while in the beginning I didn't know how to use a distributed DSA. I was looking to the proper way of doing things. Now we are already at the point where we have quite a lot of knowledge on how to use these systems. And the proper way for me of using Git or whatever for maintaining a package can be the best one for me, but another guy can have a, another best way of doing that, which is not actually, which is not mine. So I'm wondering whether we are really looking for the workflow or whether alternatively we are looking for an interface with, with which we can communicate between different workflows and tools. So this is kind of a, a provocative principle, you know. But I really didn't know whether we, we should look for the workflow. This one about interfaces is very important. I, I, I agree with you that the maintainer, particularly, needs to be able to choose their own workflow. However, there are a lot of people in Debian, and this has become more and more the case, who spend a lot of their time doing NNUs of one kind or another. Sure. Um, and particularly derived distros, and I think in Debian it's important that we support and encourage people to make <coughs> derived distros. <coughs> they basically always do it NNUs. And at the moment, it's not the case that you can do an NNU. Right? In, in, in principle, it's not possible to do an NNU. And what you actually have to do is learn how to NNU this particular package, because it's got some particular build system. And one of the things that I think we really need to solve is we need to get back to the situation where you could do an NMU of something without needing to take a course in the maintainer's workflow. Well, this is uh, this is one of the things I've been recently doing research on um, Debian uh, adoption behavior, and one of the things that um, one of the gems I'll uh, I'll spill it now, but this is one of the things that I wanted to talk about on Thursday. One of the gems is to say exactly that um, we can't or we should not standardized processes, we should standardize the interfaces. And we already have a lot of interfaces standardized um, because in the end we have the package build package and it is the way that everybody builds the packages. So that is one interface and that's where we have to get to. Um, now for another distro that might be a different interface but well, there are well, so called adapters. Right? Well, well you can. Hmm? You can. Yes, you can use our yeah, but Manos isn't here. <laughs> I still you build can. a lot of packages by running Debian rules by hand, and that still works. But GNU R doesn't produce the packages that the archive tools like to process. Or oh, dick. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. And no, but we, then mean, the archive is a different one. The archive is the Debian rules file. I mean, it, we get right. to the point where yeah, we I, have, I, I take the point. I agree. We have we have upstream. We have package. We have new version, we have package, we have sort of maintenance of the package, and then we always have to have some sort of output, which is like distro go build. And that interface is going to be pretty much similar all across the distros, whether it's RPM build, or whether it's deep package build package, or whether you want to do it with uh, Debian rules directly. Um, that's one interface. And I guess this is, a, this is an important point. I mean, um, I don't think we are going to find the one workflow, and 
especially not because one of the things that VCS package is all about is saying like, look, let's not get into digital, uh, into in DVCS religious wars. Um, even though, you know, a lot of it is currently about Git, there seems to be a lot of drive behind that, but that doesn't mean that we have to look only at that or that we have to, that we can forget about um, the capabilities of other version control systems. So there's no point in saying git rebase minus i has to become a part of this work. That's just going to cut out a couple of people, right? Um, now, you were just laughing, Stefan, I think, because this is part of your workflow, isn't it? <laughs> maybe this is something that, that can be addressed, you know? Maybe this is something that can be represented in a, in a different way. But is it, it is the interfaces that we need to define, and, and between the interfaces, they are sort of common patterns. I mean, I, I find myself, when I think about this, I find myself always uh, returning to that book of four, the um, Gamma whatever design patterns book that many of us have probably had to study in computer science courses, um, which is abstractions in computer programming. And they have adapters and they have uh, um, different patterns that are happening between interfaces, basically. And we are, every distro creates patches in one way or another. Whether we, in Debian, munge them all together into a diff.gz file, or whether we use Debian patches in Quilt, or whether you, we use dpatch, it's creating patches. So that's a sort of common pattern. Why? And, and most of the patches are going to be associated to some bug report, or maybe there's a, there's a, there should be the possibility of saying, this patch belongs to this bug report. So th this is how the big picture kind of forms for me. It's like. I really would prefer to be able to create a patch, maintain the patch, have the bug report automatically be notified about the patch, have the patch not necessarily duplicated in the bug report, but referred to the one patch in the version control system, and so on and so forth. Um, it, it, it is a lot about interfaces, and these interfaces are not... To think about what the common concepts are that the interfaces need to talk about. Exactly, yeah. I mean, so you mentioned patterns. Patch, right? Patch is very, well, that's almost the central thing. There's a notion of what, what's currently called uploading, which is where you commit to the Debian archive. Um, there's, we have non maintainer branches, which we think of as, we, we call men and use, but they're like, they're like silly little forks. I don't know that other districts have those too. There are a couple of those concepts, yeah. And that, that those need to, I think this is this is one thing that um, we'll definitely be talking about in terms of the roadmap, like define something like a, a commons document, something that, that um, can establish a, a baseline on which we can discuss. Um, Maybe it's not the one workflow, but maybe it is, it is sort of a meta workflow that um, that has different components, and you can piece them together any way you want. But if we can make it such that, in the end, you still have some sort of standardized, like a patch is a patch all over the place, and it because we're using distributed version control systems, I can take that patch and actually track it, not just copy it. I think that would be a great benefit. But on the other hand, I mean, this is definitely part of the ide uh, idealism of VCS PKG. It's not to say, let's take Manor's way and force you all to do that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Although I really do embrace his way, but they are, they are already at this point with Manor, we are hitting points where, where we don't know what to do anymore. It's, it's as long as we don't have to follow his GPG practices. <laughs> or mine. Um, but like one of the central Discussions, for instance, with patches is should each patch be pristine, or pristine, whatever you call it, um, in, in such a way that you can apply each of the patches separately and then you have the conflict resolution when you integrate all the patches, or is, is it a patch series where you can't take the end patch and just apply it separately? I mean, the, these things are, are stuff, things that we haven't resolved or haven't really talked about, but that, those are the kind of issues that, that we should be talking about, I guess. But that, that again comes back to workflow. I mean, that, 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 that's the interface that matters. And if that ends up being a best of the source package, then you know, as long as there's a common format there, which is either an archive going to be a monolithic diff on easy, or you know, patches that are and patches that have to get applied in a certain order. I, I think the 
think we should get away from thinking about file formats and uh, protocols at this point. Because our problem is that we don't we don't understand really what the problem is. And so we don't understand what the concepts are that we need to represent. And if we start thinking about file formats and protocols and specific revision control systems, I mean, that's all very useful stuff and people bring their own workflow to the table. But what we really need to understand is what the actual objects are and how are we manipulating them, what the abstract concepts are, and then see if we can come up with some kind of subset of this that can represent enough that everybody can do what they want. Which is an interesting point because now you're arguing basically that we should be working top down. We should be finding a sort of like meta workflow <laughs> that explains everything and then we can like charge the BZR and the Git and the Darks people oh, with yeah. filling it in. And uh, that, that's a very difficult approach to take because uh, in, in the end um, you're, you might be running up exactly against problems that are just not soluble. Um, but on the other hand, the bottom-up approach, which is Manor Sway and Git Build Package and, and, and this approach and this approach, all like, sort of like taking the tools and, and doing little things with it and then coming up with a big picture is a lot, it's sort of emergent and it's a lot more powerful. And, and to, to unify those two is, is really, really difficult. But we're facing it all over the place. I mean, uh, Stephen Langerschek was talking about that as well. He was, he was saying like bottom up, top down. Now, at some point in time, we do have to meet in the middle. Um, but I, I agree that the interfaces and, and general concepts, which I call the patterns, but that's pretty much the same thing. That's, that's something that, that has to be defined. Um, so I guess I'll, we'll, we'll add that to the roadmap. Um, a lot of you people um, who haven't put up their hands earlier when I, when I asked who of you have been involved in VCS PKG, um, it, are there are there any like hopes that you have? Yeah. One of the guys on the mailing list has been found that IRC is involved in Victoria. One of the one of the guys on the IRC is involved in Victoria. Okay. Which is I think. Okay, but Victoria is uh, is not necessarily packaging. Mm, it's no. a nice way of hosting, but. What is Vitorage? It's a, a GitHub uh, web service and it's open source software. And it all runs as one account only. You don't need to create accounts for your, for your contributors. Yeah? This is the first I've, I've heard of it, but it sounds very exciting. I mean, I'm uh, caught up in the energy that you're talking about here. And, and I'm even sitting down. <laughs> doing the NMU and, and being able to look at someone's patch history and, and see what the hell they were doing when they came up with this crazy patch instead of having to dissect it from the gift at QZ and make all the difference in the world. It's a very useful approach. I mean, how, how many of you guys are doing packaging in the first place? Is that pretty much it? Yeah, I uh, have touched the package, yeah. And how many of you are, are separating pack patches already using dpatch or quilt? That's oh. a little and bit how more many, than half, uh, I'd say. Use, I've heavily used some kind of version control system. <laughs> 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 Not counting the Debian archive. <laughs> <laughs> or CVS. Well, there's, a religious, there's a religious question I wanted to, to sort of bring up, which is going to be uh, fun, maybe. Um, do we, okay, so we understand that we can't mandate which VCS under users. But if we say it has to work with SVN, we might find ourselves trying to do something much more difficult than if we say it must be a DPCS. If you look at the VCS package homepage, I've tried to sneak in that D in front of VCS every single time that I use the <laughs> acronym. So essentially, I mean, SVN is very, very popular, and uh, it, it needs to be supported in many ways. But to be honest, I haven't lost hope that SVN is going to actually support this stuff a little better at some point in time. Well, and also, I mean, looking at thinking at the archive of the mailing list, we are all implicitly more or less assuming some VBCS. Well, what, what's the what's the difference between the two? It's, 
it's not that, that one is SVN and that one has this sort of like centralized approach. It's not even that the others are distributed. It's really in terms of like how do you track content. It is the, the question of what does it mean to create a branch and what does it mean to make a patch. And uh, modern version control systems, the ones that I've named a couple of times before, they um, all you, they all look at it in terms of content and not in terms of changes. And SVN is a ch very change set oriented approach. Now I don't actually know very much about Darks. So I have to admit. Darks is very change set. Yeah, and, and mathematically proven to be right, and, and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> well, but but it can still track content to the point where you can have like a, a common ancestor, and then you can have two people for twenty years working on two separate branches, and then you can tell Darks to merge them, and it will not. Um, it might have a problem because of conflicts and everything, but it will not actually bar. Let, let's assume that it won't. I don't really know. But, Assuming infinite memory and assuming it won't yeah, exactly. <laughs> that kind of stuff. But I, I mean, that, those are technical details, and if there is a need for darks to be able to do that, it'll it'll start growing that feature. But on the other hand, if you do that with CVS or you do that with SVN, then you are going to run into problems because they don't have that that concept of content that's being tracked. So, in in some way, yes, I think that uh, SVN is it's really hard to. Uh, to keep that in mind, but on the other hand, if we, I don't, I'm not even. But is this is this more about how we use the virtual control systems to? It seems to me that one of our goals about about this is more about um, coming up with common interchange formats that would easily share our changes with the different distributions. And whether what virtual control system we use doesn't matter as long as we have enough frame, you know. To have an easy way to these changes. Well, that, it, that's it, that's matter. it does matter because what ultimately we want to do is we want to. I think the only way we're going to get anywhere with this is if we make it possible to share with other, you know, supposing you're working on them, <coughs> right? You're going to need to have a curing. Right? And so that you're going to need to be able to have your mercurial patch queue in Debian and you're going to need to be able to pull from Zen upstream. So, because, because that's the way that everybody expects nowadays, right? If you, if you step outside the distro context, where we're, we're, we're all you know, using the archive and diffs and things, and it's all a bit kind of 1970s, if you come out and, you know, into the current century, you notice that nobody is, except maybe Linus Kernel, is posting patches to many this anymore. They're saying, here's my branch, all from that. Right, but you're, the individual person will tend to choose a virtual control system that they prefer to use. And that's not necessarily going to correlate with all the different people that want to access their That's not how it works. The way it works is you use the version control system that Upstream is using, or if Upstream is using, using SDN, this isn't necessarily about communicating back to upstream. That's a different issue. This is be honest. Right. But everybody, but 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 Red Hat. If you want Red Hat and, and Debian to share patches, and they're both tracking the same stuff that's coming from upstream, and upstream are also taking some of the patches back up. This is exactly the use case and the scenario that these whole distributed version processes are designed for. Well, let's, and let's, <laughs> let's separate a couple of the issues that are um, now discussion here because I think if we want to talk about them all at the same time we're not going to get anywhere. Now to start with yours and kind of go back to four from, from the back to the start, I hope I remember all that, is that if, if Red Hat does stuff with Mercurial and we prefer Git, uh, I don't think we, we're going to get anywhere like, to be able to exchange um, and track change sets or commits between Mercurial and Git at this point. And at least I don't think that should be our goal but I'm if somebody wants to do that, then somebody should do that. Um, it's more that if you have Zen, then maybe you can agree with Fedora and Red Hat that you should be all doing it in Git, or that you should be doing it in Mercurial at, at this sort of project level. Um, now, with NMUs, it means that you might have this Git project here, and you might have this PZR project here, and then the Mercurial project, and you don't really want to learn three different version control systems just in order to be able to do your job. Um, so now we come back to that idea of having some sort of abstraction 
a, a command that implements the common patterns and then figures out which version of the control system it is that is being used at the bottom. Now, Can I come up at this point and mention and plug a friend of mine's program? He's written a program called VCS, which does what It's do. namespace pollution. <laughs> 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 but no, it's, it's not a version control no, system. No, what no, it is, no, is no. the program that yeah. figures out which version control system it was and does the right route for you. Well, you can tell your friend that my program that tries to do this sort of stuff, which is unreleased and I haven't really gotten anywhere, is also called DCS, so now we have a problem. <laughs> but it, it's sort of the standard name. I've, I've seen your hand. Um, yeah. Let me just make one more point, which is in the going backward, which is um, this is something that came up in the discussion with, uh, with you about the workflow. I don't actually know if I had the discussion with you or whether you were just the one that was referred to have that idea about um, sort of having the representation not be in a version control system, but have it be in quilt patches. And when you want to work on something, you import the quilt patches, and then you use the version control system to work and have all the features of version control system, but in the end, you, you put out the patches again. Um, one of the people in that discussion said, look, I don't, I'm not going to create feature branches. I mean, I'm not developing software as a packager. I don't need to create a whole branch for something, even though it might be cheap, but like, Heck, you know, like in the end, I'm going to have seven different branches, and every single time I want to make a change, I'm going to have to ask myself, which branch should this go on? That's too complicated. I, I don't think we even have to go this far. We don't even have to say feature branches are part of the workflow. So if we instead can find a way in which the changes are represented such that they're interchangeable, um, and the version control system that we want to use can use those patches. Then we get back to the point uh, of, of representation, not, not necessarily file formats, but sort of the, the, the concept of being able to have a standardized way of representing a change. And then, then we could get version control system agnostic at that point in time. Right. And Quilt is a, is a good step in that direction, but I don't know if it's the right one. I mean, this is, this is stuff to be discussed. Right. And you, do you want to reply to this immediately? Okay. For that, we should agree um, if a patch should um, apply on another patch, or if a, uh, if a patch set uh, uh, will be on its own, uh, and to exchange it be between projects like Fedora and, and uh, whatever, BSD or Debian or Ubuntu or whatever. Yeah, that's a, the question of the step model, patches yeah. in a series and, and separate patches. On the other hand, so far, I think at some point in time, someone on the mailing list asked like, for a case where this was really like a problem, where there was a big difference between the two. And I mean, to everyone here in the room, it's quite obvious, right? Like, there are conflicts, come on, there will be conflicts at some point in time. But then, like, is this actually really a problem? I mean, it, are we going to resolve the conflict once here and expect our users of the patch to do it a thousand times for every single time that they use it? Or do we just do it every single time that we have to use it? How many times are there actually going to be conflicts? I don't know. Depends on your feature branches, I guess. Yeah. If you well, want to use them. If one feature depends on another feature, it but then obviously uh, it will uh, create it. starting to develop a program, not. But right. so maybe so you should be able one to thing do that. What happens is upstream take your patch, right? How do they do that? Well, if upstream are in the modern world, they pull your feature branch. No, and if, then. If both upstream have the maintainer and the newer one. <laughs> but, <laughs> but especially <laughs> upstream. <laughs> so if, you, if, you if they do that, that, if they do that, and you're using, and everybody is using the same version control system, then you don't have to notice that this has happened. Yeah, but not everyone is going to use the same version control system, so we need to sort of find a way to. <laughs> right, so, and, and this is a crucial. This is one of the crucial questions. Are we trying to support a workflow where we choose a different version control system to upstream? Is not the, not the only problem. Even if they are using the same version of the system upstream, maybe look at their patch, which is functionally fine that they, they spot that you didn't follow a naming convention and they, they change some viable names to, to better fit naming convention. And, <laughs> and then, again, they cannot pull. Or maybe they pull and they have a patch. Well, if they do patch. that, then when you pull, you get their version and it works. Yeah, well, then you retire you know, your you know, own feature branch and so on. No, no, I mean, it's, it will not just a, a fast forward using it. I mean, you will need to, to work on that and adapt. Sure. So. You, had, you had a question. Oh, yeah, I was time. just going to mention that there are an increasing number of 
there's intrinsic support between different di distributed version control systems uh, for each other's protocols and formats. Um, so that seems to be getting uh, to become to be becoming less of a problem. LVT on IRC also so just differentiating between feature and fix. And also the, the basic unit of operation is the patch. I mean, at, at present, the quilt methodology does only, they're all, everything is a patch. They're not, there's no distinction between which direction they go. And that's well, probably the, worthwhile. Well, this is something that um, I thought could be handled with namespaces, but that's, um, um, that's declarative and sort of that's, that's not a rule, but that's sort of just this, a guideline that you agree to. I mean, it, I use Git a lot, and Git allows you to use a slash in the name of a branch. So um, I can say my Debian slash docs branch, or my upstream fixes slash man page typos branch. That gives me a sort of impression as someone who uses a file system that this is sort of like a, a namespace, right? It's a upstream slash man page fixes is something that is destined to go upstream. But this is convention. This is something that, that but this is also something that, you know, it might make sense to just agree upon. But into the VCS, into distribution. Yeah. The feature versus fix. Right. And differentiation is going to have a different flow because right. the, you're more likely to take fixes. Right. And, and this is this is part of the sort of like bottom up thing again that we want to do. I mean, we could we could go ahead and like define a taxonomy of these different name spaces and then impose it on everyone and uh, you know send thugs around and beat everyone over the head who is not doing it properly and probably fail with this approach because we're volunteers and we don't like to be told what we're doing. Um, on the other hand, if we actually can figure out what everyone needs and then come up with a proposal that suits everyone and then actually condense it, as soon as you build up a sort of inertia of a standard, then people are going to be like, okay, I prefer this to be called, you know, and I prefer British English spelling on this, but fine, I'll go with the American English spelling or something like that, um, because there's a benefit in, in using it. But at this point, um, we haven't even gotten to, to be able to say what are the different namespaces that we need. Does it make sense to differentiate between Linux and BSD on the namespace level, for instance? Does it make sense to differentiate between Ubuntu and Debian? Does it make sense to have a different uh, differentiation between RPMs and DEP file formats? There are a lot of different ones, but this is, this is definitely an open question. And I'm hoping that um, well, here at DEPCON, obviously, it's kind of difficult to, um, to, to ask people from other distributions. We almost had a couple of people over, but um, then uh, there were actually scheduling problems. Um, to talk about it, but at LCA, for instance, we talked a little bit about this and, and came in, in some sort of like understanding, but didn't actually manage to produce any output at this point, just because the idea is sort of new and everybody wants to think about it. Which is why I think a roadmap, where maybe the first step could be to define what you know what what is it that what are the different types of patches that we want to track, which goes back to LBT's comment. Um, Patch or feature patch and fix patch and I Debian. Hmm? I think this is a red herring. We should be thinking not about what the purpose of a patch is. That's that's something that people can work out for themselves. Um, we should be thinking about the data flow of patches. Which patch is going where? What's it against? How do we share it? How do we review it? How do we commit it? Well, but you just said which patch is going where, so that's sort of the purpose of a patch. I mean, well, I'm not, I'm not saying the purpose of this patch is only feature. Cause a patch, a patch doesn't by itself go somewhere, right? Always, whenever you submit a patch to somebody, there's a, there's a like typically an email, right, where you say this is what it is, here's a, you know, maybe that's actual bug report or something like that. And the patch has made that. No. No, the email that you use to submit the patch is not metadata for the patch, right? You've got it upside down. What we've got here is an interaction between people with the patch as a kind of like parcel thing 
can do that. Yeah. All right. But maybe we don't want that sort of interaction. Maybe, maybe we, want we don't want to interact with people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's this, this inherent problem with interact. We could, we could interact with people, with, uh, in, in, with Fedora people on one package right now. But like, damn, that person just went to vacation and is gone for three weeks. And now we're stuck. We can't, we can't continue working. But if, you, if that person was following the, sort, the same sort of convention in the version control system that we are, we don't need to talk to them. I mean, I'm not saying that this is the goal that we should strive for, but we should definitely try to avoid creating bottlenecks at this stage. But the, your red herring comment is absolutely correct, because um, maybe, I'm, maybe what I just said about like, all these different dimensions, what you should differentiate between patches, maybe that's completely over-engineered, and maybe it's, maybe a patch itself doesn't have a purpose, but only the time when the patch is used or accessed by another person, then there is a purpose. So when I go and look at Red Hat's package and decide which patches I want to take, at that point I'm making a personal technical decision about, maybe a political decision also, about which of these things I want. And that's not controlled by the person who broke the patch. That's controlled by yeah. the person who's taking it. Yeah. And that's why when you submit a patch, you include an email. It's so that you can, you know, if you push the patch, you have to explain to the person who's going to take it why they should take it. Yeah. Well, there are, there are a certain subset of patches that will get applied upstream, and then hopefully it all trickles down and obsoletes your your own tracking of that patch. Sure. Yes. In an ideal world, we wouldn't have to deal with patches at all. <laughs> Aren't we thinking too much about patches? We're thinking about modifications we want to track. Like in the ADM, you want to track the feature um, like block assembly or something. You don't, you're not necessarily interested in the patch itself. You're interested in the description of the bug number upstream. You're interested in the patch series name. That's what you want to track long term, isn't it? So, I think the atomic piece probably the patch plus the I call the metadata, but um, the information you have, and that's what you need to have to track to get the feature. <coughs> but you, it might be several of them you have to track to get the full features somewhere. Like so, in my opinion, this isn't even about version. Well, it is about you need a version control system to track this efficiently in a way, but it's more about exchanging these um, modifications between distributions of what you want to do. Is that something we basically agree on, or is that? So you're talking about like, let's say you have a, a patch and then you have um, a, an introduction to that patch, whether that's going to be an email or whether that is stored in the build or, or whether that's the git commit message or whatever, um, a certain number of like fields, right? Bug fix field and, uh, and contributors field and whatever it is that you might want to track. Um, that's, I think that's one important thing that would make sense to standardize because there are a lot of people now using version control systems to fix bugs, and there are at least as many different approaches to track which bug is currently being fixed. Whether it's called Debian space bug colon then the bug number, or dead bug colon then the bug number, where what I've seen, what I really like personally is um, bug colon and then dead bugs colon slash slash and then the number or something like that. You know, like different. Um, ways of representing the information that, that should be associated with this patch, but not necessarily, um, it doesn't have to be like mandatory information. It's, it's information that is there that you can take, and so everybody can stuff additional stuff onto that patch, um, bug numbers and so on and so forth, and make it grow. So I, I agree, this is, this is a sort of one of the points that we should agree on. On the other hand, what I would really like to be able to do is let's say SUSE fixes this bug in MDADM for me and I pull the patch and I'm all happy because I managed to like get it out in half an hour on Friday night and I'm off into the mountains and then on Monday SUSE finds that they actually screwed up but you know it only causes complete data loss in one tenth of a case or something like that but I don't know about that you know because I don't actually track the patch that they that's, made. That's what I mean, you want to track modifications. That's yeah. Common. So yeah, I, I definitely want patch, to be. You have some kind of central point which knows about all the patches and all the distributions and knows uh, this patch is called this distribution like this. 
well, it, I, in an ideal world, it has the same name, like feature X. So, and if any distribution modifies this patch, you will be notified by something. Well, whether that's a central entity, I mean, now we're getting into the, the uh, super mirror idea, or yeah, launch, <laughs> launch <laughs> pad, basically. <laughs> which, you know, it's a worthy cause, I think, but um, I, also, I also raised at one point in time one of the concerns about Launchpad, that it's not distributed. That um, I don't, I don't know whether that is. Some, I mean, then you have a central entity that decides that you know those 15 distributions have worthwhile bug trackers, but those 27 over there, I've never heard of them. You but know, I, like, no, I don't mean centralized by for every distribution, but more for everybody has the possibility to set something up to do this. So maybe that distribution, yeah. that distribution, that distributed version control itself. So yeah. You can sync with Red Hat, or you can sync with Gentoo, or you can sync with SUSE, but you don't have to. And they yeah. can same So if if, if exactly. when Susie commit this patch on Friday, if at that point they give it a name in their namespace, which other people can find, but essentially they publish it, yeah. and then later when they update it on Monday, they somehow update it in the same place, whatever name that you pulled on Friday. You, you know, then there's a possibility that some cron job or devil yeah. could go and fetch that and, and send a mail saying yeah. they updated this patch and here's the change message. Did you want to do anything about this? But definitely pull, not push. Not not have like some sort of central entity where you have to like check your patch in and then it gets approved and then like it's pushed out to all the distros and says, you know, like that's not gonna work. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're, trying to we're trying to obsolete upstream. Right? Yeah. <laughs> or into or or take a lot of work off upstream. <laughs> <laughs> However you want to put it. Um, well, no, we have we have a couple of packages where there is no upstream anymore. We have a couple of packages where upstream simply disagrees with one of the things that Debian does, and we will have to keep this patch forever. But then Fedora doesn't really care about that patch, so there is this sort of differentiation that I wanted to make. But yes, um, if, if on Monday you come back, um, and then you either go and sit down and say, let's see what the world has done over this weekend, and you say sort of like MR pool, or MR update, which is this multi-repository tool by Joey has, and pulls in all your changes, and then you go like, oh, Susa had found this cool data corruption bug, and I'll uh, just upload a new package myself now as well. Um, the, the sort of pull approach, I think, makes a lot more sense. Um, so that you can also choose, you can say, look, I, I, I really, really appreciate Fedora, and I really appreciate uh, Gentoo, but let's say SUSE doesn't work because I don't like Microsoft, or you know, what, whatever it is. Um, it needs to be your own decision. I to wonder, I wonder how, how many upstreams there are that either don't want our patches or that are sort of dead. Are there any numbers about that? So, it's not gonna be are we maybe investing too much power into something that just affects a very little amount of packages in real? That's a it's a valid point. Um, I don't have any numbers on that. Does anyone of you know? Or there was a talk on on the subject about uh, the, the the data extractions uh, from and slot count on. All the packages mm -hmm. in Debian, and uh, it was like 40 million slock added by Debian or something like that. I think so. It's really not a small amount. Yeah, but then oh, in, in these cases, we don't really know whether um, the Debian maintainer is simply not pushing upstream, or <laughs> well, um, whether upstream is actually dead. Or th this is definitely something that that should be figured out, or could be figured out. But it's a valid point. Um, of course, if, if this is a, a small number, then uh, then no, we don't actually have to invest a lot of time in it. On the other hand, I think um, almost all the serious big programs have patches that ought to be upstream, but that upstream never work. Yeah. And in many cases, those are the same patches that Fedora wants too. Exactly. And then have a sort of like level underneath upstream to make work easier for them not to have to include if devs and that kind of stuff. And they might not do it. James? I, I, I agree that I think the, um, the case where we have a dead upstream or an effective fork in the distros is not the common case. So it, it shouldn't be what we optimize for. But 
I think that um, the same things fall out if, that if we have the, um, the distribution processes more similar to the upstream processes. So um, taking a patch from another distribution looks just like taking a patch from upstream, then it, it makes the collaboration easier while, while allowing you to do the effective fork kind of thing, um, but not encouraging it, let's say. Well, for instance, I mean, uh, Postfix is uh, software that is A, well maintained, it's working perfectly well, and uh, it's used on pretty much every single distro. Now, there are patches in Debian that Vitsa Venema has basically said, I'm, uh, this looks good, but I'm not going to put it in until you can tell me that um, this works well across all of Linux, because you may be Debian, but I don't really care. Like, give me data, you know, make, make Fedora, use it, and so on. And if, if at this point in time you have to sort of triangle, right? You have the yeah. upstream here, and then you have all the distros there. And if you can have this level where you can have cross-distro exchange that is so simple that you can literally, yeah. you know, like, click without using a mouse, that kind of thing. Like, and have, uh, having the patches like isn't bad, generally, unless they're, unless they're static, unless they're stuck in the package. That's generally a bad thing. Um, so you can, if it's just easy, just to create the patch and stick it in the package and get it moving upstream, even if it doesn't go straight in, then then that's going to be a useful thing. I think I should prove myself wrong right now because I'm maintaining ISI, the IRC kind, and um, there's this first starter text that popped up when you started for the first time and don't have a config file yet. And we patch it into go connect to IRC Debian org and go to hash Debian for if you need support. And the same goes for Ubuntu, they patch it to their likes of course. And so this comes also to your namespace question. There is a need for Debian and separate Ubuntu namespace in this case. Well on the on the one hand, I mean uh, Everybody should be able to decide themselves what they want to patch, but it would be nice to be able to say, look, like, world, these are Debian-only patches, don't even bother looking at them. Yeah. Whether it, it makes sense to have that or not. This is, this is one thing that should be definitely addressed to tag the patches somehow. These are private patches that don't, most, of, most probably don't make any sense by any other distribution which would be us help very lot, uh, a very much amount uh, to be able to get the patches that we want to have back to us. If they do take their patches properly, we don't have to go through all of them and see what makes sense for How many no. patches does Ubuntu's ARC have? Um, Two or three more to what I have in Debian. Right. So, how long does it take for you to read the 60 character description in each of these patches and decide, um, decide whether you <laughs> like it or not? But whether it's worth it? Takes it with every single update because they might, they still have this branch that they need to maintain and it might or might not, with every single update they do, contain another patch that might or might not make sense for me. Right, but That's the, the problem, here, the in problem here isn't that the patches are tagged by Ubuntu as to whether you want them. The problem is that you're making the same decision on the same patch over and over again. If you only had to make that decision once and you could tell some computer somewhere, look, I just don't want the Ubuntu help message patch on and then you never saw it again <coughs> until you, you know, unless you actually went to looking, you know, can I have the full list of patches, including the ones I rejected earlier? Then, what then, then the number, of, then the, the amount of work you have to do is every time Ubuntu introduces a new patch, once you have to decide whether you like it, and that's probably more reliable than having Ubuntu tag the patch in a way that means that sometimes you don't see it because the Ubuntu maintainer broke some crappy thing in the wrong field. But the Ubuntu might have updated the patch in the meantime to something I like more than I have uh, than it has been, has been before. Well then, you know, one thing you could do is you could say, well, this is a good purpose, but I don't like the implementation, 
and then the system would automatically tell you when they changed it. But it, it comes back to again doing a poll instead of a push. Right. But if it's, if, if it's like a branding patch, then Debian's probably not going to want to see it. If it just says Debian to Ubuntu, then you're probably never going to want to take that patch. But then if we fold in like a, a grammar fix into the same patch, then you can probably just blame us for merging two distinct patches into into one patch file. Cause we, just you know, mail James. The, <laughs> the, the, Ubuntu, the Ubuntu developer who does that should just say, well, this is applicable to Debian, so I will go and push it to you know, say, I've got this grammar fix, I think you should really take it because it affects Debian too. Like, um, w there shouldn't be a replacement for developers doing the right thing. It shouldn't be, I've, I've put it in the, I've put my patch in the namespace, which means Debian might see it at some point, so I don't have to forward the patch. It's the same thing with the, with the mailing to the derivatives keyword in the PDF, PTS. That shouldn't be a replacement for attaching the patch to a relevant bug report in the BTS because that's the way we should submit patches. Yeah, I think Ubuntu is a bit of a special case because Ubuntu is a Debian derivative. They have a much bigger responsibility to tell Debian about stuff they do than the door of Debian, right? But one thing that would be nice is if you could, if, if something could automatically tell you every time Fedora invent a new patch for their ERC, you know, and Fedora can't be expected to mail Debian. And, but there's no reason why some Debian machine couldn't be occasionally polling the Fedora repository and saying, oh yes, I see there's a new patch here, and it would send you a little email with the, with the, with the paragraph of description. And then if you decided, to, you, you know, it was some brand new patch or some stupid thing, you'd ignore it, and if you liked it, you'd say, oh, we'll have a look at the patch, maybe commit it, maybe track it. So maybe, uh, the, so maybe uh, track the patching the package tracking system for that. Also, look, not only look on Ubuntu patches, but also looking on SUSE and... Yeah, but ideally without 27 different implementations. Where's the funnel? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we could probably do that. I mean, we we actually um, we have something in Ubuntu called Harvest, which watches for um, it's it's designed to watch for low hanging fruit because um, we we have a bit of a problem with um, people who uh, attach a patch to a bug report in Ubuntu, and because there's no one caring specifically for that package, it just gets ignored. But like, there's a patch there that's like it could be ten minutes work for someone just to make a little improvement to and and send it upstream, um, but. So we, we have something which watches for patches in Launchpad, and it also polls for patches in other distributions. So it, I, I think we could probably turn that into mailing the PTS as well, if, if, if you desire. But then, then we get back to the point that Guido's point, and I think Ian also raised earlier, that um, now you have one implementation for Launchpad, and one implementation for DevBugs, and one implementation for Bugs and one implementation yeah, for... Yeah, sorry, I wasn't proposing that as a long-term solution. I mean, right. Sorry, I, I went a little off topic, but um, I feel we could we could uh, help Debian to watch other people's patches, but yeah, sorry, I don't, I don't mean we should have us taking care of everybody's patches. No, in not, even, not even that, it, it's just that maybe we could get to the point where um, we have some sort of like basic patch entity or modification yeah. entity or whatever you want to call it. If that was a standard way to go to some other distro and find right. out what their patches were and pull them, and find out when they've been updated. And yes. Identify, you, know, you have to identify the package, you have to identify what the patches are, you need to be able to track when they're different from the last time, all that kind of stuff. And ideally, maybe have that patch be identifiable, so that if you take it and then uh, and, and, and you add your own make metadata, and then somebody else takes your patch and also pulls from Fedora, like Ubuntu, for instance, pulls from both, and then the patch is merged. And then, right. and then the Ubuntu developer has to, you know, you know, if they're identical, good. If they're not identical, then they have to like yeah. them or something. And they find out. Well, the, the change is the change is identical. I mean, right. um, may, maybe. Well, they maybe they're if the change is not the identical, then they have to. Right, but in the way that a version control system. Do exactly. Right? That, this is, I guess, why we're back to, to version control systems. Whether the version control system is the right tool for that. Especially like we need a global patch tracking system. Yeah. But I, I, I do I do agree with the comment that this is upstream. This is they they're the ones who you know you should be you know if you're a maintainer for a package then you're subscribed to the bugs on that on the upstream project and when Fedora create a patch they should be 
attaching it to a bug in the upstream bug report. So okay, it's okay, okay, but that, fair enough. Let me just take that one step further. Um, now let's say you're on that, on that Saturday afternoon when it's raining, <coughs> you're at home, and your wife and the kids are at the zoo. Now it's not raining. It's beautiful outside. <laughs> your wife and the kids are at the zoo, and, and you have it's sunny, so you're not hours, outside. Right? You have three hours in which you can do whatever you want, and you decide to do any use. And you have three packages that you would like to fix. And this one is Bizadar, and this one is Git, and this one is Mercurial. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're going to be like, and, and upstreams are like that as well. You're going to be like, okay, I just wasted two hours during three different version controls. No, you've, you've, just, de you've just described like Ubuntu development, so I'm very, very keen to work right. on this sort of stuff. We, do, we, you know, we touch all these things, it's Quilt, and then the next one's Detach, because so you're touching right, loads of Let packages. me tell you how I, how I work for Ubuntu for gone on for two years, and let me tell you how this works. You get the source code, you also dash A, dash, dash, delete, the thing you just unpack into a separate build directory. You try to build it. If it builds, excellent. That's that's you know half an hour saved already. <laughs> Don't worry there. Um, then you edit some file randomly, but not in the build directory. And every time you change anything, you rsync and you build only ever in a clean thing. And that's the only way to make an NMU to a Debian package without having to spend half an hour or an hour, or two hours, reading incomprehensible old versions of CVDS made files to try and figure out why it's untiring this over here and this patch isn't that or the other. Right, but this isn't Debian specific. This is right, and every, easy. well, Debian is a bit worse for this than most others, <laughs> because our... No, no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but anyway, it's, it's, it's really, really bad. Um, and if we could just improve that to the point where, you know, I would say, I mean, to, to be honest, I don't care. If I, if I have to learn four version control systems, that's easy, right? There's only six version control systems that anybody's likely to use. And if I have to learn all of them, that's fine. I don't have to want to have to learn six different old obsolete versions of, of CPBS or strange pre dead make things that like we're copied into the package directory and they'll they not unpack some toggle in a weird way. But every package is different and it makes it impossible. So maybe NMU is, is very much too Debian specific. If we focus on, on changes and then we say like really should be pushing that change upstream. Yeah. But and to continue so my to continue my point, sorry, I was just saying that um, we should make it. We should make it the easy, the the obvious, the easy thing, the impossible thing to not do. To just push these changes to the upstream bug tracker, rather than inventing a, an entirely separate, like infrastructure for doing all this. It should be based around the upstream project, so that you, by default, you create a patch and it gets attached to, like, to go to go a bit too far. You just create a patch it's automatically attached to a bug report on upstream, and all the distribution developers subscribe to it so they immediately become aware of the patch existing. But I think it, you're living in La La Land. <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally Upstream agree. don't have a bug tracker. <laughs> well, yeah. In, in, right? in, in if, you're, case, if you're really lucky, Upstream, you know, I mean, I work now in my day job, I work for Zen Upstream, and we've got a bug tracker. It's, it's excellent. It's a lovely honeypot. Nobody reads it, right? So, <laughs> you know, if you follow bugs in the Zen bug tracker, well, sure, okay, so there, there are projects like this, but let, now let's say we have this project, we have Zen, and you decide, I can't work with that. Now you're going to take your Debian bug tracker or whatever it is, and your own version control system, and you make it work. And that if you make it work in such a way that um, this is something that accounts for everyone, that, that even Fedora could use, and then you write an email to them and go like, hey guys, this sucks, right, doesn't it? Um, let's just use this, um, you know, like as a proposal. Are not going to possibly not going to force them to use the Debian bug tracker for Fedora maintenance, but maybe you can have your like in um, like in uh, repository bug tracking, like SIL or, or bugs everywhere. That is um, a sort of like standardized approach where you can account for the fact that upstream is useless, and you would like to feed it back, but you can't. So you have to stop like that one step short. I think this, this notion of trying to deal with upstream bug trackers, if you bug trackers at all, is, is a bit of a red herring. I think we should be not thinking too hard about it. It's, it's useful to be able to link things to bug reports, maybe um, automatically send mail to your bug tracker about it, maybe. Um, but 
What we really want is a sort of federated system where I choose who I'm looking at and who I'm pulling from and who I get notifications about. And that's done by software run for me by my infrastructure team or by my colo or whatever. Yeah, but, 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 I but guess, doesn't that, uh, doesn't but, that like, encourage effective thoughts that you, you just have to don't care about anyone else if you don't want to? I, well, they can pull from you. What it does is it means that the person who's receiving the patch, who after all is probably key to have it, we need to make that easier. The problem that we have at the moment in this area is that we can't find, you know, Debian can't find Fedora's patches easily and see what they're about and track them and all that kind of stuff. And if, if we could well, do that, there was a standard way for us to at least find out what Fedora's patches were, then we wouldn't, you know, we don't want to go diving around in Fedora Bugzilla. We just want to, we just want the code. I suppose then, and does this approach with uh, defining a common workflow really get us any further to receiving Fedora patches? I mean, we can change our way of doing things, but we can't change it for the Fedora people, for the SUSE people, for Red Hat, <coughs> and who else is out there. And I'm, I'm not sure if this approach really will get us that cooperation more easily. Well, I think there are two dimensions to it. On the one hand, um, there is this case where we have potentially have to interact with multiple packages within Debian, and we would like to have a sort of like more uniform approach so that we don't have to deal with different systems at every single step, and we can actually deal with separate packages. I mean, ask the security team. They would probably yeah. really like being able to do the same thing for all packages. Um, that's one dimension. And the other dimension is that going and, and saying and, and offering to Fedora this sort of like cooperation. And it's not that it's not that we are defining this as the way and then saying, look Fedora, use it or don't. Um, it's more like we would like to figure out what does Fedora do and what do we do and can we kind of come together. And I've talked to a bunch of Fedora people, and everyone who is involved in Fedora's uh, um, attempts to, to use distributed version control systems, and they are thinking very much in this, along the same lines. They think that uh, patch management is, is central, and needs to be, that patches need to be trackable, and they're, they're all ears for it. You know? like, I mean, Fedora is not like, you're Debian? No, I'm not going to talk to you. Go away or something. There might be some other districts that are like that, but Fedora definitely isn't. If we can find a way together that is conducive to everyone, and then just sort of have it there. I mean, if you, as a maintainer, decide you don't want to use it, then it's your own freaking fault. Don't use it. It's fine. There but are a bunch of uh, base packages we have in Debian that often pull from uh, other distributions as well, like GCC, Win Windows, and mm -hmm. so on. Sure, and it would just be made easier. Yes. I mean, in, in the end. Well, in a way, we already have this. It's kind of 1970s and we located, but there are patches, there are diffs, there are email lists that let you know that there's a new diff out there, and there's mailman archives with URLs for the long-term record of those diffs. And that's a push approach. Well, you, you subscribe to the mailing list and you get the push, or you pull from the URL in the mailing list archive. Um, and everybody uses that some, at some level. It is something that's common. Well, I mean, it's like functionality. For example, you can't identify reliably and automatically whether some particular change is a new change or an update to an old change or a new version of an old change. And it's obviously no, but it's, it would be possible to build such a system on top of that. We it would be possible, but you know that's just a question of what infrastructure do we use. All we need is a protocol that lets us automatically determine whether this branch that we have here is now, you know, for example, whether the Fedora thing that we pulled last week is now the same, has been updated. And uh, let the Fedora people say, have they taken that patch? So they can look at our repository and see whether we've taken that change so that, you know, they can talk to us about it, or you know, there's all sorts of reasons why you want to know how they taking this change. 
Even though, on the one hand, I completely agree with you. Diffs are, are there, and it, it, that's, this has been working forever. But on the other hand, six, seven years ago, we didn't have any usable distributed version control systems. And now we have them, and in some ways, the entire um, development cycle is changing. And I'm just wondering if there's not like a way in which we could surf on that wave and, and make it easier. But on the other hand, an important point that, I, that has been coming up over and over again is we can't really over-engineer anything. I mean, we shouldn't, right? We, we could make this as complex as possible, but then A, we're not going to be able to sell it to anyone else, and B, it's going to fail all over the place, and C, it's actually going to take longer to learn than four different distributed version control systems in one afternoon. So the question of is this something that's worthwhile doing, and what's the scope of what we're doing, and what, what the solution should be, is an important one. I have the feeling that Lam has been doing quite well in tracking patches from other distributions as well, beside them. And why not go the, the same way as launch, or let launch, launch that do the work? It doesn't do. It doesn't do very well at patches at the moment. It does well at bugs, but not at patches. Um, and the only reason why it does well at bugs is because there's an adapter for the Debian bug tracker, and there's an adapter for Bugzilla, and there's an adapter for this bug tracker. And well, that, while that works, that doesn't necessarily scale to the point where I mean, if, if like let's say the Git kernel starts to use bugs everywhere, or SIL, which is in repository mm -hmm. bug tracking, and very cool by the way. Um, and, and hopefully something that we will also be doing at some point in time, um, <laughs> then if, if the package that you want to be maintaining uses one of those, you are at the mercy of the launchpad people, um, or, or you have to run your own instance and say, look, here's my new adapter, and I'm making it happen now, and that's wait three years, and it's in a stable release, and now I can actually make it happen. Um, it's not scalable in that way. Whereas if you have an approach that that sort of like standardizes the change, and I'm not. I'm, I'm trying to say like let's keep this keep it simple, but no simpler, right? Um, if you have that change, then you don't actually need this level of abstraction anymore. Then you don't actually need to have adapters for the different parts. And you know, it's a. I'm sure but it's I think I think there's I think there's something. Have, you're right to have n adapters so long as we don't need to have n squared. Right, it, it would be all right if we had to write a, a parser for sure. yeah. SRPMs and a parser for Debian source archives and a parser for Git trees and a parser for Mercurial trees. You know, you write 10 of those things and that would be that. If you need to write a converter from every one of these to every other, then yeah. you do. And, yeah, and, and keep, it sent, keep it decentralized at the same point in time. Or but it, to be Launchpad probably does have some things we can we can learn from because it's been doing this sort of thing. It, it, it had the idea for bugs when it started that it, it should be tracking things in multiple places because they they exist in different systems and you want to know when something's updated over here so you can update it over here. So there's probably things we can learn, but it, perhaps the design isn't isn't one we should pursue. Well, Debian has a tool like that as well. Um, we can track um, Launchpad and. Bugzilla bugs and actually have automated messages sent to our bug tracker and to the upstream bug tracker about changes to the individual bug reports. But I mean, now we're back at the n squared part because the, we've in, we've implemented Bugzilla, you've implemented Bugzilla, and yeah. and it just doesn't scale. I I don't know if it's if it's feasible if we can find a a, a format that will actually be. Um, the one thing that everybody would like to use, and that, that's compatible with everyone's workflow. But on the other hand, um, if there's, if we, if we manage to come up with something that is suitable to all the needs, then it's just gonna, you know, the people are gonna start using it. One other thing that I'd like it's to suggest, take years. we should have as a very the, 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 it's amazing that our current system doesn't support it, which is the ability to find the source code for a package. So we've got the Lintian lab, which has all packages unpacked, but it doesn't have patches applied. And the reason it doesn't have patches applied is because we have to run the program to apply the patches. And we need a system where you can get the source code and do 
you know, LinkedIn lab like stuff or other kinds of research, automated source code scanning tools, all that kind of thing without without really well, having to understand how every package works or run some kind of program. Isn't that the key package version three format? Well that'll help a bit. But the DSA team is going to implement with uh, Twitter in the near future is going to have something like sources that you have because all of what is currently in stable testing and unstable, having unpacked the whole source, source of every package with, with all the pa uh, uh, patches applied um, that are currently in the Debian 5G set. I hope they're going to use Git for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope they're going to use Git for that. And I hope they actually integrate it with a snapshot that they've done for it because it's essentially the same thing. Um, it, it should be doable, yeah. Right, but, but if you pick some package where the maintainer has dumped a couple of toggles and a pile of diff GZs inside, right? I mean, there are plenty of packages like that. Yes. And, and, you know, you look at the source tree and what you get is two toggles and a pile of diffs, and you think, but that's not the source code, right? <laughs> <laughs> I can't run my C code analyzer on that. What if you had to be part of the build process where you know it's fully unpacked and applied, and then you just kind of take the snapshot and go there? Right, but this involves running the build. Right. Right, but running the package. There are some situations where you don't want to run the package. Well, you're already having to build anyway, so when you do the build, you can take, take that information and then. But you don't know at what point in the build it happens. I mean, the thing is, those packages are totally idiosyncratic. Yeah. They exist in a weird other planet or something. Well, ideally, if you really want to know, you should have all of them, everything, all patches applied, right? I mean, unless it's doing. No, that's not how, that's not necessarily what's going to be that will be something which unpacks one tarball and builds that and then deletes it and then unpacks a second tarball and builds that and. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, I can do a short recap unless there are a couple of other um, comments. Um, I think there were some. Yeah, James. So I have an, I have another I have another side aim for <laughs> this work, or at least the work I'm doing, is to make the make some of the some of the tools we have and some of the things you have to go through a little bit more sane and a little bit. Uh, more like the things that the rest of the development world does outside of outside of Debian and outside of district outside of district development. I don't know if you've ever tried to walk um, so a, a, a very good developer through their first Debian patch. Of you've got to download the source code, right? Now you want to apply a patch. Now you've got to work out which patch system this package uses. Okay, and it's just. Things like this, I think we should try and um, not continue to. We should not add to this kind of madness. While we can't, while we can't solve like patch systems and things like that necessarily in one in one with one tool, then we shouldn't we shouldn't add to it, and we should build on top of existing development practices rather than going in a completely different direction. Because uh, I think it would be very useful to distro developers if upstream developers um, were at least able to step into distro development without having to learn an, an entirely new tool set. You, you would find that a, um, they find a critical patch in a version that they know you ship and they, they provide you with a patch which you can um, instantly upload to security or whatever, whatever it needs to be. Where, where, the, where the, the transition from upstream development to distro development isn't, there's not a huge chasm in between. You just, it's just uh, you're targeting a slightly different platform rather than uh, tripping over yourself, trying to learn all these, all these new I think tools. Also, this goes for users. We've got a lot of very technical users who are excluded from making changes to their own systems, often, by the utter pain of doing what amounts to an NNU. And essentially, if you're not fully up on Debian development and you want to make some change to your Debian system, you might as well get the upstream source and go through that because that will be much less painful. And okay, well, the resulting thing won't quite work with your Debian system in quite the right way, but at least you'll be able to build it. Am I correct in saying that we're, we're getting back to the interfaces question? I mean, uh, if we manage to define an interface for what it means to modify a 
a Debian package, then no, we might not be able to uh, change all the DBS users and all the uh, tarball with their own little patch system uh, rolled inside Debian rules make statements. We're not going to be able to convert them at one point in time, but if there is a sort of interface that that simply says this is what a modification looks like. And we're pretty damn close in terms of that because we have Debian patches and, and a sort of understanding that you put a diff in there and that diff gets applied. And that sounds pretty good. Um, except if it's quilt. Except if it's quilt. Yeah, you can't just put a diff in there if it's quilt. If it's simple patches, you can. So this this still you mean the, are you talking about the series file now? Or? Yeah, yeah, you have okay. to you have to add it to series file, but not if it's not quilt. Mm. There's actually a wish list bug against quilt. So, Maybe. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I think I think we can we can get a lot of this by just building on top of distributed version control tools because a lot of the things will become the same then. But I'd just be wary of um, building um, distribution specific tools on top. And while interfaces are important, incredibly important, and um, it would be good if there weren't 150 million tools for providing a patch in that said interface, so that you could we could just say if you want to modify a Debian package start here if you if you want to get into Debian development start there but you'll probably end up where you know you might find something which suits you better well but, but if the interfaces are defined and there are 150 tools in between use any you know? yeah but you use any is a pain to people getting started well, okay then you you want to say you want to say use want, this one you won't be able to tell upstream here is the one screen wiki page that tells you how to do it it's and it's not a wiki page of pick any of these one wiki page. It's just the the thing of the thing of uh, step here one, here, are, step here, two, are, here are hundred and fifty different equally good ways of achieving the thing you want to do. It just makes people go ah. <laughs> they they yeah, might okay. they might you might consider them equally good, but I have no idea what you want to pick. That's if you a can just go, issue, isn't it? It, yeah, it part That's it partly is. But yeah, it, but if we can just if we can all. Come, you know, through this process, we can come to some agreement where we can just go. Here's a good way to get started. That's what you need. You you don't have to say this is the way that which will solve every single problem that you ever encounter when you're doing Debian development. Just like, here's, go this way. You might hit some bugs. You might hit some problems later on. In which case, you can switch. But you'll know enough by that point to know where you should go next. Yeah, and if you define the interfaces, I think that's uh, then then those 150 tools can easily evolve because you are defining that this is what a tool has to do. And then whether it's implemented in Ruby or graphically, this, like with a graphical user interface, or whether it requires you to enter text backwards, or whatever it does, um, as long as it gets from A to B, and A and B are defined, that, that's what it does. I mean, you can't define the process. You can say, this is the recommended way of doing it if you don't have another preference. But if you do have another preference, well, here are 149 to well, choose from. It's worthwhile to think about, particularly the you know upstream or end user workflow. <coughs> the most obvious workflow for an upstream or an end user, which is how do I make a change? You know what? As and should be, and there should be one way of doing that. And what we come up with should work. It should be possible for Red Hat to implement something that looks almost identical, except maybe the room has a different beginning. And, and that's the workflow that I'd personally like to use as well. You know, I, I just kind of like to concentrate on the change and then the, all the other stuff around that, just kind of like, you know, click without the mouse. I, I mean, it, it, it's a big goal, but it would be good to, to know what these interfaces are. Yeah, and it doesn't, it doesn't have to get you to a perfect situation as well, because these people aren't, these people aren't going to be modifying Debian directly. We don't have to make sure that the tools like ensure that they get a perfect patch which doesn't break on anyone's user system. They're going to be going through review. They just need to be told do this and then submit the review, and it will be it will be a painless process because we'll be able to review the patch and either tell you what to do or get it in. All right. Well, I'll, I'll try to recap. Um, pay attention because uh, if I miss something, you get to point out what I missed. But uh, I think we raised about four very important points, or at least that's what what I took out of this. Um, first of all, the, the thing about the interfaces, I, mean, I think we've all reached an agreement that we can't really define the workflow, but what we can do is define the interfaces, um, where that's a sort of like stupid term right now, but 
define what the what the concepts are, and that actually leads me into the second point. One of the um, things that we were talking about is this sort of common patterns concepts. Um, what exactly does it mean to be a patch? Or are we talking about patches? Are we talking about modifications? Um, we should get a clear understanding of what the vocabulary is that we are dealing with, so that we, we have a baseline to work on. Um, another point that was raised then was basically, uh, well, we had we had one question that went into the direction of are we are we doing over um, um, over design too much? Are we trying to achieve too much? Is it really realistic what we're trying to do? Um, how many conflicts are we actually going to do? How many uh, are we going to face throughout the lifetime of the package? How many packages are actually divergent from upstream or where upstream is dead? Does it really make sense for us to, to look at, at an infrastructure that, um, that detaches us from, us from upstream or should we really encourage work with upstream? Um, that was one of the things. And the other one was sort of like two dimensions that we were looking at sort of like in, inter-distro and intra-distro dimension, um, trying to figure out a way that is consistent, um, a consistent way of, of making changes and maintaining a package within Debian, and then the question of whether that should also apply to, across distros and possibly across other version control systems. Um, I don't think we actually reached a big consensus in that one, other than the fact we might need to start small. Um, and and when, when Zach was still here, one of the questions he asked was about um, V1 workflow and, and possibly the um, have a tool that sort of implements it. I think that's a, a notable goal, a nice idea, but I don't think we're going to get there anytime soon to have this sort of like packaging tool that you just say create new patch and then it does everything automatically independently of what distro you're on and what version control system. But I think it's a nice idea. It's a it's a good maybe like idealistic goal that we can strive for. But in order to get there we need to we need to be able to define what the different um, needs are that we need to address. And uh, the last point that we were talking about just now was sort of just like it ties into that earlier point, the sort of standardization um, to make it easier for people to, to just approach a package and be able to use it without having to learn the tools. But I, I think that point is, is sort of overarching because we have different distributions, we have different version control systems. Any solution that we could come up with, if we agree that it should not dictate a version control system or require everyone to run Debian, then um, Obviously, it needs to be some form of abstraction, um, but I guess it's for me the most important point is certainly about the interfaces, and and that also includes the definition of the of what we think is metadata or what is the purpose of a patch. Um, what maybe maybe the context of the patch? Like, is it is it the person pulling that determines the context of the patch, or do we actually already? determine somewhat of the context of a patch as the publisher? Do we say this is a specific patch, you don't actually want to look at it? Something like that. So these are these are all the different points that I gathered um, from the discussion. Is there anything that, that I left out? I'm going to be able to write them down later. Because uh, no, I guess... The legal discussion. <laughs> well, I, I, okay, we did have the legal discussion at the beginning, but I kind of tied that in um, with the question of whether we are over engineering. Um, it's, I, I thought it was interesting that you, the, the other point you raised was the sort of, uh, um, the, the second time, you, the second point you raised, you argued that um, actually you, you were wondering whether this was not too much effort um, because maybe the upstreams are, are all there and cooperative and maybe we're just not seeing that. But for me that was sort of an, a little bit of a contrast. Um, on the one hand, like wondering whether this is really necessary to do, and on the other hand, uh, um, um, putting up for discussion, which I thought was a worthwhile discussion, the question um, of whether this is something that we should, this, this version control system is something that we should uh, pursue, given that it might give, get us into the danger um, that we 
have copyrighted material somewhere in the history and can't get rid of it. Um, from, I, I fuse those two together because for me it's also a question of is this really a danger? Is this something that we have to assess? Um, and then we probably have to assess it at some point in time, but do we have to incorporate it into the solution that we find at this point in time? So there's a lot of that, like, what, are we, what exactly are we trying to do? How much of it are we trying to do? That's sort of the overarching meta question, um, which we didn't resolve today, and I don't, didn't really expect that. And uh, we can all resolve that on Thursday when we define the roadmap. <laughs> but, <laughs> and then there were a couple of other um, much more specific technical tasks, the interfaces, the data definition, the concepts, and uh, I thought those were very valuable. And I think on that basis, uh, we should be able to say, like, this is something that we have to do first. And then once we have that, then we can take the next step and, and possibly move in this direction. And, and you know, in all cases, uh, there are already existing solutions, good workflows that people can use. I just think it doesn't hurt to think about what happens next and how can we actually make our lives easier. Because in the end, um, I, I really would prefer not to spend so much time on packaging. I, I like to write the patches, I like to change the code and make them testing. I even like that. You know, like run it and you, you go like, yes, it works. Great. Exactly. Zoo. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'd, I'd really rather not have to maintain feature branches. It's not one of the top priority things in my life. All right, well, thanks all for showing up. Um, it was a pretty long discussion, one and a half hours. Thank you.